I'm Pete McCall, and welcome to episode 28 of All About Fitness. The best experts in any field are the ones who know how to apply the foundational principles extremely well. Every exercise program includes the same variables. The exercise selection, the actual exercises you do, intensity, which is the amount of weight, reps, rest interval, sets, and speed of movement. Knowing how to properly apply these variables is essential for maximizing weight loss or getting rid of unwanted body fat. On today's episode of All About Fitness, I sit down with Nick Tuminello and we talk about how to design workout programs that can help you get the results you want. Nick is a personal trainer, strength coach, educator, and author who was recently recognized as Personal Trainer of the Year by the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Nick is an expert in strength training and is a frequent contributor to publications such as Men's Health, T Nation, and Bodybuilding.com. In addition, Nick travels the world to teach personal trainers how to be more successful. Our conversation today focuses on the benefits of strength training for weight loss, the subject of one of his books. We also talk about a variety of topics related to working out in general and strength training in particular. In a field where a number of self-professed experts claim to have the secret to success or promote workouts with little to no scientific validity, it's good to know that there are professionals like Nick who take the time to do the research so when they dispense advice, it is based only on the known facts about how the body adapts to exercise. Over the past few years, Nick and I have gotten to know one another at various fitness conferences and meetings. At one point in our conversation, I refer to Nick's approach to fitness as basic, and I mean that as a compliment. Workout programs do not need to be overly complicated or use a variety of exercises better suited for an acrobatic routine in order to be effective. Knowing how to design a progressively challenging workout that applies the appropriate amount of stimulus to the body and, and this is important, how to properly recover from the workout so the body experiences the desired adaptations are the two most important components of any exercise program. If you enjoy pushing iron or want to know the most effective things you should be doing in the gym, then you'll get a lot out of today's episode. For more information about Nick or links to where to buy his books, all that stuff is in the show notes. Before we start the conversation today, I have a few words from the sponsors of All About Fitness. Active Motion Bar, TerraCore by Bicore Fitness, and Skills Products. Active Motion Bar is the first resistance training bar where 30% of the weight is a moving mass. An Active Motion Bar can help you strengthen your fascia and elastic connective tissue as well as your muscle, which is important for staying injury-free during the aging process. Research has found that exercising with an Active Motion Bar can be up to 170% more effective than using traditional weighted bars. Active Motion Bar, let the resistance move you. www dot a c t i v motion bar dot com Vicor Fitness is the maker of the new TerraCore, which is a step, bench, balance trainer, and multifaceted exercise tool combined into one single platform. Go to v i c o r e fitness dot com to see the newest piece of equipment that will be taking the fitness industry by storm in 2017. Use the code A A F to save 20 percent on purchasing a TerraCore of your own. TerraCore by Vicor Fitness. Vicor Fitness, better results from better products. Skills is a sponsor of All About Fitness. Skills makes products for all phases of the workout, from warm-up to speed, agility, strength, and most importantly, recovery. No matter what your fitness goal, Skills has a product to meet your need. Use code PM30 for a 30% discount on your order. Skills Fitness and Performance Products. Be ready. www.sklz.com All right, I'm here today on All About Fitness with Nick Tuminello. Uh, Nick, congratulations because you were um, recently awarded the NSCA, the National Strength and Conditioning Association Personal Trainer of the Year. So congratulations on that, man. 
Oh, well, I appreciate it, man. It's a huge, huge honor for me. So thanks. Yeah, no, and, and I've been uh, been a fan of yours for years. Um, like a lot of people on the on the show, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people I interview for the podcast. Nick and I have worked with each other a couple times. We've been at some of the same conferences. And one of the things I really like and respect about Nick is the fact that he keeps things pretty basic. In in fitness and in exercise, there are a lot of people who like to overcomplicate things. And Nick does a great job of keeping things basic. So, Nick, uh, I'll let you do a little bit, kind of uh, tell us like what what your focus is now, what you're working on as a as a trainer and as as a coach. First off, man, I, I appreciate the compliment, but yeah, furthermore, I really appreciate the platform that you're providing for people like me, uh, or for, for me and people like me to share our experiences and our um, and our approaches and rationale with everybody else. I mean, this is a free resource that you're providing, but it doesn't come free to you. It takes a lot of time and effort for you. And, and, uh, and I don't think we do a good enough job in recognizing that, uh, these days. So I just want to make sure everybody recognizes that you're putting your time in to do this, um, and appreciates it. No, I appreciate that. And, and what I want to, cause the reason why I started this is I want to get, I have, I have the, the advantage and, and have the opportunity of knowing so many good educators who really know what they're talking about in fitness that I saw a need to some of the conversations that we have when we're at a conference, when we're at a, you know, when we're, we're in the evening, when we're just hanging out, being social, I wanted to try to capture the essence of some of those conversations and share it with the, the average fitness consumer and especially for, for people in Gen X who, who might be looking for ways to uh, – they don't want to slow down. Even though their body's telling them they're getting old, they don't want to slow down. So what are you working on these days? What, what's uh, keeping you uh, out of trouble the most? <laughs> well, um, i am got, got several things going on. But I would say the main exciting thing is I've started to work on my third book. This will be the final book that I had written, you know, planned to write for the, over the last few years. Um, I don't want to give away too much about it because it's a fluid process. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I wouldn't anticipate it being out at least for another year, you know, to two years, but, um, the initial stages of, uh, of that book, I've got like the first drafts written of like the first four chapters already, but, um, I'm very excited about it. I've been excited about it for a while. So that's one of the new projects. And then, uh, we have, we're filming a new, um, uh, information product that'll be a downloadable product for sale. We're filming that uh, next Sunday. It'll be all on power training for personal trainers. It'll be really cool. It won't just be like just talking about Olympic lifts. You know what I mean? It'll be really a lot of really cool details and, and approaches. So I'm excited about that as well. That that's cool. And and um, but hopefully the timing works out. I'll definitely if if they're up and ready to go, I'll add them to the show notes. Uh, for the podcast, so people listening to this can can click and see that. Now, one of the things one of the things that Nick does, one of the many things he does, is he's an author who's written a couple books. And Nick, I've used your uh, strength training for fat loss in, in a program that I've written for for Nautilus. I just use as a reference. And what I want one of the things I want to talk to you about is the role that strength training plays in fat loss. So, what do you think is the biggest misperception about fat lo- about fat loss or weight loss when it comes to exercise? Well, I, by the way, I really appreciate that, um, that you, that you did that. It means a lot to me, man. Um, well, I would say the biggest misperception is that, you know, cardio is the better method of exercise for, for fat loss. So let me, so let me say two things here before we get into this and I'll be quick. Um, one, it's not what this or that expert says. It's what the scientific evidence says. All right. So, um, I'm going on what the consensus of the evidence says. So, you know, a, a recent systematic review meta-analysis came out for those who don't know, that's like a study of studies. So what they look at is they say, okay, you know, a hundred studies have been done looking at, you know, cardio versus resistance training. I'm just making up numbers here. Um, and they look at the cri- they have some criteria and they, they eliminate the low quality studies. They stick with the highest quality studies and then they look for some sort of do they all tend to point in a similar direction? And if they all tend to point in a similar direction, then we they come to a conclusion about what the body of the scientific evidence says. That's what systematic reviews and meta-analysis do. They're one of the strongest forms of evidence. And recent systematic review demonstrated that um, strength training – essentially I'm going to change the wording here a little bit, make it less scientific. But was essentially superior from a fat loss perspective over the long term than pure – cardio or combination cardio strength training workouts and that when you're doing strength training you want to focus on maximizing the metabolic cost of strength training that is exactly what my book strength training for fat loss was was doing 
uh, was talking about doing, and we talked about doing that before that meta-analysis came out because I was familiar with what a lot of the research had said. It's nice that we have a paper now that creates more of a consensus on it. And uh, real, real quick, Nick, I just want to interrupt you um, for a second because I think you kind of touched on a good thing. When we talk, when, when, when guys like you and I, we talk about exercise, we, we're talking about it in general terms. But the hard thing is that, and you said it earlier, um, the first two words out of anybody's mouth when they're talking to somebody about about an exercise program are that depends. Like I, I can't really answer a question that you ask unless I know about a number of variables, a number of factors of what you're doing in your daily life, what you've done for exercise, what you're, you know. So what we're, what we're going to talk about in the in the podcast, I want to put that out there for the listener. That there's a big that depends. What we're going to talk about is what the scientific evidence tells us and what we can kind of expect in general terms. But each and every person is going to experience a slightly different result, even if they all follow the same program and same meal plan and everything. It's going to affect people differently. Is that one thing you try to point out to people when you when you go out and you speak and you do education workshops? Well, I think you make great points. I mean, yes, there is going to be – there's the factors of genetic trainability, which um, is, is how, how you respond to an exercise stimulus. And we have great research on that in cardio – and um, and in strength training, that you know people can be on the same program and have vastly different results. Some very impressive, some not so impressive. But it doesn't mean the people that didn't get impressive results from one program wouldn't get impressive results from a different type of program. All right, so that's one. And you're right. And you're right. It's context specific. But um, saying it depends, as you already know, is not a is not necessarily an answer to a question. It's the start of a conversation. Here's what it depends on, and what yeah. we're really talking about is depends on what is the stimulus that you're trying to create with exercise. In this case, when the goal is to maximize fat loss with while minimizing muscle loss with strength training, the goal is to set up a resistance training workout not to maximize muscle hypertrophy, i.e. muscle size, is to maximize the metabolic demand of the workout. What that entails is basically two things, trying to burn as many calories as possible during the workout and try to elevate the metabolism as much as possible post-workout. Now, I will say the whole EPOC thing, excess post consumption, how much your metabolism is raised after the workout has been highly overstated and overrated. I mean, it really is minor, but it still, it still helps. Um, I want to come back to one thing. The other misperception about fat loss and exercise is that exercise either way in any, is really you know, the most powerful method. Um, and this is coming from a guy who wrote a book called Strength Training for Fat Loss. You, know, you, you need the diet portion of it. And when I say diet, it doesn't mean going on some extreme restrictive diet. But if you're not in a caloric deficit, um, then you, know, you don't have the principles in place to really lose fat, and this is not really a negotiable thing here. It's been it's been studied across the board in, in different levels of different nutrient, um, different diets, different nutrient emphasis. You know, protein, carbs, and, and whatnot. So now there's two ways to create a deficit. You can either eat less calories, and or you can burn more calories through exercise. Um, normally, it's the combination is is the best, but that's one of the things with cardio. Cardio does help you burn more calories. Um, basically per minute than strength training, than resistance training does. So there is research that may show it's superior. Problem is, uh, you know, you could just not eat the 300-calorie bagel and you basically just offset the 30 minutes on the treadmill, right? But what, what resistance training provides that cardio doesn't is all the different muscular benefits. So you don't just want a, um, you know, low fat. You want to maintain muscle for other reasons and muscle creates the shape of your body. So it's it's what gives you that toned look that people talk about, or at least females talk about. Well, and, and that and that's the thing that, that I think people we we tend to simplify we, we tend to oversimplify things sometimes, Nick. I think when it comes to exercise, by do cardio because it burn, burns fat, or by by you need to, to strength train. You know, you need to do a certain amount of repetitions to tone muscles, and that's why that's why you know, I really like your approach because you you try to keep things simple, but you do it in explaining. You do it. You keep it simple, but you still apply the science. You still apply how we know the body adapts. So when it comes down, what are the what are the top like two or three techniques of using strength training to promote fat loss? Oh, great question. Um, well, I was going to say this. It's all about what the principles dictate. So I tell trainers, you know, take a principle based approach, and if you take a principle based approach to exercise, 
what your ex- the exercise applications, the training direction you take will never go out of style or out of date and you won't go wrong with it. And that's the thing. Exercise trends come and go like clothing styles, um, but principles don't go anywhere and that's the problem. So when you look at principles, everything we're talking about here will not be out of date 10 years from now and uh, and that that's important. So in regards to the to two or three methods for maximizing the metabolic cost, talked about this in the book. I call it the three C's of metabolic strength training, and those are the following. Circuits, complexes, and combinations. Everybody knows what circuits are. You string multiple exercises, different exercises together. A combination, or sorry, a complex, would you take, you take one piece of equipment and you basically do a circuit with that same piece of equipment without ever putting that piece of equipment down. Um, circuits and complexes are my two favorite of the three. And out of those two circuits and complexes, complexes are the most conducive for people to do who are members at a big box gym, because the worst person in the gym is the, is the, I'm using that person where they need like four, (laughs) four things. So actually just, just two days ago, I was on the cable column at my gym. I go to kind of a bro type, you know, old gold's gym type gym that I work out of myself. And I had this one of those full like universal cable columns and we have two of them. And I was doing just a little bit of arm work. Yeah, I still do some body part stuff. It's totally all right. So anyway, I'm doing low cable curls and super sending with triceps extension, super basic stuff. And there's this guy doing lat pull downs on the cable machine next to me. And he says, how many more sets you have available? And I go, I got two more. And I look around. I'm like, well, there's the other cables behind me is open. The cable in front of me is open. And there's like another cable on the other side that is open. There's somebody using the other one on the other side. So it's like three cables open. And I go, I go, my man, if you don't mind me asking, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, you know, be rude or anything. I'm just really curious why you asked me, do you like this cable for some reason or whatnot? How come there's when the other one's open? He goes, no, I'm doing a circuit. I need this whole thing. And he did this like circle, you know what I mean? Stir the pot movement with his finger. So it's like he was going to do this circuit where he needed to dominate every cable. And I'm just thinking like, okay, you're well-intentioned, but that's already a problem. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So, um, so you don't want to be that guy. Um, so that's where complexes come in. You grab one piece of equipment and you just bang out one exercise after the other. The reason why that works from a metabolic standpoint is because you're hitting multiple muscle groups. The more muscles work, the more energy demand, calories or energy, so more calories burned. And the fact that you're not uh, – you're, you're not – just resting two minutes or whatever in between sets means you're getting more sustained activity. Um, and then also we want to maintain the intensity. So when you have a total body, higher intensity done for a longer duration, that's the combination for an increased metabolic demand. And, and that's and that, that's an important thing to realize that it, people can put that together easily. And what's an example of, of, of a, of a easy complex because somebody could do in a big box gym but they have a membership to one of the larger gyms out there um what's some what's an easy little complex they could throw together without interrupting too many other people oh i'll I'll give you i'll give you a great one and all you need is a single dumbbell all right so um it's it combines four exercises not necessarily in this order but i'm going to give them to you in my favorite order so you do a free let's say you hold the dumbbell in your right hand it stays in your right hand the entire time so you do a freestanding row. So that means you're basically doing a bent over one arm row. You're in a split stance, right leg back, left leg in front. You might bang out eight to ten reps. I'm just giving you a fairly arbitrary number here. Yeah. Uh, yes. With rep, rep ranges of rows. So then you stand up tall, and then you do reverse lunges, stepping back with your right leg, and then stepping forward with your right leg, and repeating with the right leg every time. Then you swing the dumbbell up to your shoulder and you do overhead presses. Oh, by the way, you do the reverse lunges for like eight to ten. Then you do like overhead presses. You could do a push press if you want. Maybe you do six to eight of those. Normally, you're going to be weaker pressing than pulling, so you might do less reps on the weaker movements. And then finally, you bring it back down, balance on your left leg. Again, dumbbells in your right hand. You do single leg Romanian deadlifts. So you did a knee dominant movement, a hip dominant movement, an upper body push, an upper body pull. And because you're dealing with an offset load, your core muscles have to be activated a little bit more in order to maintain your body, keep everything kind of aligned and centered. So that's a total body um, complex. 
multiple muscles, never had to put the dumbbell down. See, I like that. That's easy and it's effective. And you, you've hit on some, and the fact is you're using a lot of really complicated stuff in there, but keeping it relatively simple because for people listening, if you use a dumbbell on one side of your body, the fact is a lot of muscles in your body are working to help stabilize and control the mass. And anytime you, you activate more muscles, you're going to automatically burn more calories. So, so Nick's concept of just using one dumbbell on one side of the body at a time is effective from a number of different approaches. So, I mean, that's just a great example, Nick, of how you do things. Now, to, to, let me let me just say one thing real quick. Yeah. Uh, actually, two things about that. Some people have limitation on the grip. So, grip is an issue. What you would do is so that would be called a unilateral complex, where you do everything on the one side and then you switch. Uh, if grip is an issue, then what you do is do a left-right complex. So instead of doing you know everything with the right hand, you do all the reps of the rows with the right hand, switch your stance, and switch your hands, all the reps of the rows in the left hand. Put it back in the right hand, do all the lunges with stepping with the right leg back, dumbbell and right hand, switch hands, all the lunges with, it, with the dumbbell in the left hand, stepping with the left leg back, and so forth. So that saves the grip problem. That's And, that, and see, that's, uh, that's the type of stuff that um, – is really helpful that, that a lot of gym uh, gym goers don't don't think about and and I apologize one of the first one of the first questions I like to ask people and uh, and we'll hit to it now is what do you think is the most common mistake that people make when they go go into a gym I mean I'll be um, releasing this uh, early in 2017 so hopefully uh, a number of uh, we get a number of new people that that we want to get them to stay around for a while but what do you think is a common mistake that most people make when they when they finally get get into a gym and start trying to work out on their own. Well, I mean, it's it's just doing things that are not sustainable. So let's we, we hear about it with diets all the time, right? You know, so you go from being the person who doesn't like to eat breakfast and, you know, eats only tw- two big meals a day and maybe snacks. And then you say, well, now I'm going to eat six egg whites and I'm going to eat this and then I'm going to eat four or five meals a day. And it's just totally unsustainable. It's a whole turnaround for your life. And obviously we know that that doesn't work too well because it, it's just too many different behavior changes at one shot. Um, that go against your normal time frames. Same thing with working out. Um, this whole mentality of, yeah, you know, I haven't worked out all winter, um, so now I'm going to get in the gym and start training like I'm training for the damn Hunger Games. You know what I mean? You see people <laughs> just just looking like they're dying and they're trying to take you know these hardcore classes and then doing everything intensity intensely and they're just beating the crap out of themselves. So yeah, that whole mentality of. Yeah, I haven't worked out in a while, so why don't I start off training like a Navy SEAL? You know what I mean? And get the Navy SEAL workout. But that's what we do, and that's just not su- sustainable. Um, and again, it doesn't follow any how we know how you progress in life. You know, I mean, if you start taking tennis lessons, they're not going to put you with a tennis, they're not going to make you play a professional tennis player day one. You know, um, you, 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 you take baby steps, crawl before you can walk. So we tend not to do that with working out or dieting. Yeah, and that's the thing that people don't realize. I think that, that most uh, average people don't realize is that it's a, it's a process, and you have to start small and take a little step at a time. And it, you can't just, you know, people didn't gain 20, 30, 40 pounds, even five pounds overnight. It's not going to come off overnight. It really comes down to a matter of making some simple lifestyle choices and, and implementing those over time. And what do you think? what do you think is like the biggest, like today, starting today, what's one little thing? that somebody could do that could start having an impact on, on their workouts or on their fitness level? Like what's just one small thing that, that somebody might overlook that's an easy kind of habit to start trying to add into their, their lifestyle? Man, I would just say the quickest and easiest one is add more protein to your diet and the protein shakes are easy. And I know I'm an ex- supposed to be an exercise guy and no, I'm not a dietitian. I don't try to play one on social media or a podcast interviews either. <laughs> But um, what we what we know again from well established research is increasing protein intake um, can obviously increase muscle mass, uh, but it also increases satiety. It basically helps reduce appetite, um, which is a really nice thing as well. So there's really no side effects to that um, to adding a little bit more protein into uh, into your diet, unless you've got some sort of um, you know, renal dysfunction, then that, that's, that's a special populations type case. But that's a very simple, accessible, and buying, you know, a three-pound thing of protein powder is, is, is very cheap. Whey protein powder is very cheap these days, or an alternative if you're not into whey for whatever diet choices. 
That, that's and see, it's, I try to look for simple little things like that. Now to, to shift gears here and, and go into to your other book and, and specifically to talk about how it affects uh, the the over thirty five, the over forty uh, Gen X uh, fitness enthusiasts is with your with your latest book on uh, sports. What's it? Uh, building nope. muscle and performance. Yeah. What what should people over thirty five or forty? If I'm I'm in my forties right now, Nick, and I still. I, I try to train with the mentality that I can still play a half, a half a game of rugby if I get the opportunity. I don't know if I can, but that's still my mentality that I try to maintain a, a fitness level, that mindset. How does, how, does muscle ma- how does muscle gain and how does like just performance training change for those of us over 40 that still want to maintain kind of like that, that, game, ready, that game ready fitness level? Um, uh, well, I like your policy there about, you know, still get to do a play half rugby. I like that. Um, cause at least you have some sort of goal in mind that you want to keep some sort of, um, measure, some sort of baseline that you have in your head. Well, I would say there's, that's a multi-factor answer. I'll try to give you as best I can here. One is, I would say this to anybody is that understand that the number one goal of exercise is to make sure you're using, and when I say exercise, I mean, strength and conditioning. Um, that we're using that as a form of medicine, and I don't necessarily mean from the medical pr- properties. I just mean to help fight off, you know, aging, increase our health uh, uh, parameters, get us stronger, looking better. But it's not what we want to use have uh, have to take medicine for. The reason why I say that. So the number one goal of exercise is to not get hurt while exercising. Performance or physique or a combination is secondary to that. And when you start looking at it that way, you start looking at exercise selection and intensity and all these things as risk versus reward. And then you start to see a lot of the ego issues in there. So that I would say that's the number one thing, especially from a performance perspective. Um, I would say, too, is that um, it is important to get stronger um, – that said, I would probably say the number one quality from performance, most people, if you're able to play a sport, are not too weak to play their sport. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to play it. Normally, they lack the power endurance to sustain that strength throughout the length of competition. So um, that's where conditioning comes into play. So um, – I may be getting a little bit too in depth here, um, but that's the that's the conditioning part of the strength, uh, you know, of the strength conditioning game. So don't just do things for three and four reps. You know, that's where interval training comes in. That's where doing battling ropes exercises comes in. That's where sleds and things and leg complexes and complexes that I mentioned earlier uh, for fat loss uh, are also great for uh, conditioning as well. The only difference that a conditioning focus workout to a fat loss focus workout is the amount of calories that you're taking in. Okay. That makes sense. Cause when you're doing conditioning, you generally want to create an anabolic, you know, you're trying to, you know, increase muscle or increase size or increase, uh, overall, I mean, overall fitness level, correct? Well, yeah, it just, it just means that, um, you know, someone, as I said, even though the book that I wrote is called strength training for fat loss, the first thing I say is that you're you're going to watch, you know, what you put in your mouth. You're going to watch your diet to, you know, to get to, to help put you in a caloric deficit, and then you strength train to improve the shape and function of your body. So, in the case of conditioning and the fat loss isn't the main goal, well, then being in a caloric deficit isn't necessarily the, the priority there. Yeah, and, and I think, and I, I think too, to, to, it's important to recognize that as as people get a little bit uh, more mature, as they get a little few more years under their belt, um, or a few more years behind them, I think there's a recognition there that they may not be able to to maintain their their six pack body that they once had, you know, in their early twenties. But it's being able to have the the fitness level to get out and enjoy their favorite activities, whether it's going hiking or mountain biking. And what role does strength training play if that's what people are training for? Say, I want to be able to play uh, soccer with my kids or I want to be able to go for a, a long hike with my kids on the weekend. How does strength training support that? Well, there's that's several factors. Well, number one, so we have what we all tend to focus on with, with exercise in general, but especially strength training. It's normally associated with physique, right? You know, so like how you look in the mirror. Or performance, you know, like how much you bench press or how high you jump or something like that. But we forget the health and fitness in the in the middle of it there. 
So the benefits of resistant training, and I've written articles about this, all highly scientifically evidenced, are everything from, you know, increased sleep, less stress, more, you know, better perception of wellness to reduction in all cause mortality, which basically means like less risk of developing disease that's deadly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, increased bone, you know, increased bone density, and also weight management. So there's a difference between weight management and weight loss. So basically, you use it can be used if you don't want to change your diet to offset the calories that you're taking in, right? To kind of keep things at a little bit more of a balance. Um, so where that can also come into play is that your muscles control, or basically what produce and reduce and control forces. Well, you're always dealing with the forces of gravity, and then you add in momentum and things, and that's what involves hiking and running, walking, throwing, playing frisbee, picking things up. So if you are stronger, you're increasing the loading tolerance that your tissues can maintain, and that means you're less likely to create an injury that is associated with getting closer to reaching that tolerance. So we know that you know strength training helps does help risk, and then conditioning helps you uh, resist fatigue. And that also helps you f- reduce fatigue, potentially reduce fatigue-related injury. And, and that's important because I think people people overlook that fact that um, you know as as we age, you know, our we, we break down. I don't want to say break down, but but our tissue our tissue will change. If we're not strength training, we can lose muscle mass. If we're not moving or adding a wide variety of muscle of movements to to our body. Um, then what we will do is we'll lose range of motion in certain joints, and our tissue will lose lose range of motion. Uh, what do you what role? Because you mentioned earlier about muscle isolation, but how do you add movement training? I'm looking at the 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 um, the content, the chapter content for your the the power book, the uh, the performance and power book, and I see in here that you have push workouts and pull workouts. How do those different? How does that approach to programming, like focusing on pushing or pulling? How does that differentiate from a, a traditional bodybuilding approach of, of a muscle isolation, like doing lats or doing pecs? Okay, so I got to I got to come at this really simple because this could be a discussion that could take hours. Um, yeah. So the, the, let me just clarify a couple points here for everybody. I know you understand this, but just in case. Um, there really is no such thing as an isolation exercise. Now, I know that doesn't make – it's just a category. And here's what I mean. If I'm doing biceps curls and I'm in that – you know, I, I'm still using my lumbar erectors to resist the weight from pulling me forward, all right? So it, it's, it's a focused uh, um, resistance uh, – you know, trying to, it's a focused exercise – to try to create more overload through the elbow joint, therefore controlled by the bicep. But other muscles are having to work to keep me upright based on the physics involved. All right. So, you know, that that's you really you can't say anything is truly isolation. It just means certain exercises are focused on creating more force through uh, one joint or certain joints than others are are designed to put more force across to put force across more joints. All right, that's a better way or to focus the force across certain joints. That's probably a better way um, to look at it. Exercise, resistance exercise is just putting force across joints. All right, secondly is that muscles create movements. So this whole idea that, you know, train movements, not muscles, it sounds really good, I get it, but, you know, muscles create movements. So there, there, that's, there's that. Um, so with that being said, we do have the principle of specificity involved, and that's really what it's all about, transfer and specificity. The closer an exercise is to a target movement outside of the gym, the more transfer it will have to that movement, and the further an exercise gets away from the target movement you're trying to improve, the less transfer it will probably have to that movement, which is why you want to have a wide variety of exercises so you have a wider transfer. All right, so I had to say all that. So the idea is that all those different types of exercises, from integrated to more focused exercises, i.e. traditionally called isolation movements, um, they all have different benefits and limitations. All right, so in a given push and working at push, pushing workout or pulling workout, we'll do some exercises that – for lack of a better term, we could call it a total body push, something like a standing single arm cable press, 
where I have to use, you know, my legs a little bit, my torso to stabilize me while I use my upper body pushing muscles to move the weight. Then I might do more of a compound movement like a dumbbell press. So now I don't need my torso as much um, to drive, to create a pushing movement. And then I may go and do some more isolation movements. I say that with quotation fingers to focus on the in, on you know to focus a challenge on certain muscles that are involved in pushing triceps, a little you know shoulder, pecs, and whatnot. Um, to get into the ben- the specific benefits and limitations of all of those would be beyond the scope of this interview. They're covered in, totally. in the book, but they're all mutually complementary. It's not this just do this or just do that concept i i feel that that's a, a problematic argument in the field that we have but i but i think uh you know I, I like that approach and i like the fact that you're not you, you don't tend to view because i think sometimes again we we see people that overly complicate it and say you only have to do one and and this is the best way to train whether it's a movement or whether it's isolation and i think what what's important for people to understand is that it all works it just to turn it's it's finding out what works best for your needs now before we wrap up i want to ask you cuz i know you speak a lot about this and i really i like your approach to it um, but your kind of your approach to core training what do you think is a is a very common mistake that people make in core training and and what what could what are a couple things that people could be or should be doing differently when it comes to quote unquote strengthening their core well, I'm probably guilty of falling into this, but we know from evidence that pretty much the whole overemphasis on the whole emphasis on core training as like the most important part of the body is not evidenced at all. It's it's I'm not saying it's not important, but uh, it's certainly its value in performance um, and even in back pain. You know, measures of strength and stability are have been highly overstated, overrated, and therefore overemphasized in training as this somehow the, the most important part of the body. Again. I said overrated. I'm not saying not important. Everybody wants to argue the opposite. Oh, you mean it's not important? No, I didn't say that. You know, so um, and we know that from from evidence uh, that it doesn't have as much impact on performance. And then the measures necessarily of core strength don't necessarily change measures of back pain, levels of back pain, and things. Now, again, um, I've written articles on this that look at the detailed arguments back and forth that people say. You know, oh, I did core and my back pain went away. Okay, well. We could have that discussion. Um, that doesn't necessarily refute what I'm saying here. It's a different argument. Um, so I would say that just not to overemphasize it and feel like it has to have special privileges over other areas of your body, um, I would say is probably the biggest misconception about it. I still train it. You know, we still, you know, train linear. We still train lateral, rotary, you know, whether it's anti creating movement or resisting movement. Um, but this whole idea that it's this special main part of the body um, that's the key to all performance and health is, is just not well evidenced. And, and I think that's the thing um, that, that, that people do is they overemphasize it. I mean I know for the last year I've been on a big tear to try to get people thinking that, that bracing your core or, or you know contracting your core during movement is that, that that's a trainer wasting their breath because anytime you pick up a weight – you mentioned this earlier when you're talking about unilateral trading. Anytime you pick up a weight, your 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 deep stabilizers are automatically going to fire to create that stability. So I don't need to tell you to, to, to tighten your core because it's going to tighten. If I tell you to tighten your core, you can't focus on other things that your body's supposed to be doing at that time. I mean, is that is that kind of along the lines of, of your approach to it as well? Correct. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, hey, Nick, I really appreciate your time. Oh, and oh, one other thing. I was thinking about this as, as you're talking earlier about – the push pull, and I think, and just I want to see it bounce this off you and see if if you you kind of agree with this. But when we look at strength training, if I'm looking at building muscle size and really developing hypertrophy, which is a changing definition, I need to focus the force. I need to focus the load of the weight into that specific section of muscle. Is that correct? I mean, that's how muscle responds. Is you place force in the muscle, the muscle responds by becoming bigger mechanically. Is that correct? Correct. You're, yeah, you need to create mechanical tension uh correct you create, um, yeah you create mechanical tension in a specific section of muscle well yeah uh, but it doesn't mean so and so that's really what uh, that's what really what isolation exercises are what they're doing is trying to focus most of the mechanical tension in a given area um versus compound which is distributed distributing it more across several areas that's a really better way to look at it 
Yeah, because um, you say that, and I think that's a very you know again I I sometimes overcomplicate things, so I want to kind of hear how you explain it because I think that's a very important thing to people to realize is that both have I mean everything has a role. Everything you know, if you, if you want to do compound exercises because you're trying to expend more energy, perfect. But if you want to, you know, let's face it, ninety percent of people pick up a weight because they want to look better. So if you if you want to make a muscle look better, you have to emphasize a specific section of muscle. Would you agree with that? Correct. Let, let me. I, I mentioned this in my mus- in my book, Building Muscle and Performance. But the whole idea that you know, so okay, so now we've 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 tweaked the definition of isolation exercise, and I still use that because it's just such a common term, right? I mean, obviously, we're yeah. getting a little talk here yeah. and specific, but there's still this big argument misunderstanding that well, that's not really how you move in life and in sports, so therefore, it doesn't have much. You know, transfer from a neurological and force generation. You know, from a neuro, um, uh, you know, a, a force generation or neuromuscular coordination patterns type perspective. And there, and that's not a, a false argument, but it has transfer, indirect transfer in other ways. So, for example, if you're a, you mentioned rugby, that's an impact sport where you're having to push against people, and people are trying to push you and knock you over. Well, here's physics coming into play. Those pesky facts that. <laughs> So a bigger body is harder to move, right? And you and a bigger body has a more uh, a stronger platform to then use its strength from. And we know that in looking at, um, we see the heaviest uh, boxers are the ones that tend to have more knockout power. And we've looked at research. There's research been done on pitchers that heavier pitchers tend to throw the ball harder and faster. All right, you know, throwing a punch, throwing a ball. So getting bigger, just putting on pure hypertrophy. By doing bodybuilding stuff can have a, can have an indirect functional transfer for an athlete to help make them stronger from their feet and able to use their strength, pushing somebody over and getting and resisting somebody pushing them over. All right. So that's one thing. So sometimes one of the best things that you could do for somebody in sports um, is add muscle size to them if, if, if again it's position specific but sometimes you need to have that there's other things I could get into it so this kind of stuff is forgotten about and never talked about we always just look at a movement and we go well that movement doesn't look like a movement in sport therefore non-functional waste of time non-carryover so that's just false yeah, I think everything. I mean, everything works. Everything, everything works, and everything has an effect. And everything, you know, it's just a matter of, of figuring out which one you want to do. And and one of the things I tell people often is that, hey, after you've been doing something for eight or ten weeks, what should you do? Mix it up. <laughs> yeah, it mix it up exactly. That's what we know is is after a certain period of time, your body adapts. You don't need to train. I think. Muscle, the term muscle confusion is a marketing term that oversimplifies it, but after a period of anywhere from two to four months or eight to 16 weeks, your body will adapt and the work will become easier and it's important to do to apply a different type of stimulus. Well, Nick, man, I really appreciate your time. Um, for people that want to find out more about Nick Tumanello, um, his website will be listed below in the show notes and I'll have links to his uh, two books, uh, Building Muscle and Performance, A Program for Size, Strength, and Speed and strength training for fat loss. So Nick, uh, anything uh, you want to share about what you have coming up uh, in the coming year? Uh, no, nothing specific, man. Nothing I want to drive any. Well, um, we do have the Brolando coming up in Orlando. Myself and Alan Aragon is a lot of buzz with that. And I'll be traveling around the world. I think I'll be in the UK in March, um, doing a little, some one day mentorships there. And then I just invite everybody to stay in touch with me, social media, on my Facebook and then on my website, uh, nicktumanello.com. All right, cool. Nick, well, thanks a lot for your time, and I will look forward to seeing you on the road. Thank you, bro. Well, hopefully you got a lot out of that conversation. If you find that you're enjoying All About Fitness, could you do me a favor and please take a moment or two to give us a rating on either iTunes or Google Plays. You know the deal. The better the ratings, the higher up in the search results it goes, and then the more people have access to this information. But as you heard, you don't really need to be overly complicated when it comes to exercise. It really, What really matters is using the right intensity, you know, changing the rest intervals, because you know, if you have a longer rest interval, you're actually working on strength because your body has more time to recover. So that way you have more energy with every lift. Now, if you want to burn energy, then you should probably 
shorter rest, you know, shorter rest intervals between the sets. But all that information, if you want, if you really want to know the secret to strength training for fat loss, I do recommend going to Nick's website, reading his articles on TNation or Bodybuilding.com, or in the show notes below, I have a link to his Amazon page. So hopefully that gives you some information because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about strength training. And there are a lot of myths, a lot of gym myths around strength training. So what I'm trying to do is bring you one of the top experts in the field so you can kind of push all the myths aside. And you heard in our conversation about neither one of us, you know, we're both very hesitant to say anything de definitively because we don't know. Based on the research, we have an idea of how your body might adapt to exercise. But the simple, the simple reality is every single person is going to have a different response. Responses might be similar, but it's been different from person to person to person. And you've heard me talk about that with other, with other show guests. So if you ever hear of anybody, and I've said this before, if you ever hear of anybody saying their way is the only way or they know the secret, your first exercise is to walk away from that person because they're just trying to sell you a load of crap. You know, you really want to, you know, when it comes to exercise, there's going to be some trial and error. You're going to find some things that maybe don't work for you. You're going to find some things that you love and that just give you, get you the results you want right away. The, the probably part of the fun in working out is finding that out. You'll find, you'll do some stuff and you're like, eh, you know what? That's not for me. You know, I've taken a couple bar classes with friends and you know, what? That's, I understand why people like bar, but that person, that's not for me. And likewise, I know a lot of people who've tried a kettlebell workout and they prefer not to do it again. So the important thing when it comes to finding out the exercise program that's going to help you get the results you want is that you look at the stuff, you try out different things, and always ask. Ask a trainer. Ask an instructor. Why are you doing these exercises? Why are you doing this exercise this way? Why are you structuring the workout that way? If the person can't give you, give you an idea or can't give you a clear, concise answer, you don't need to be wasting your time with them. And I mean that. You know, any good professional in our field will know why. They'll know the why behind what you're doing. And that's the big difference. Guys like Nick, myself, and the other guests I have on here, we're all about the why. The what? The what's relatively easy. But understanding why you're doing something and how the body adapts to exercise, that's the important part that we're all looking for. Anyway, thanks for your time today. Again, please take a time to give us a review on uh, iTunes or Google Play. You can reach me at Pete at PeteMcCallFitness.com if you uh, want to give me any ideas for guests or if you want to book somebody on the show, please reach out to me, Pete at PeteMcCallFitness.com. And you can also follow me on Twitter, PeteMC underscore fitness and Instagram, PeteMcCall underscore fitness. Now, I try to put exercise related stuff up on Instagram, uh, but just a little warning, I also probably might throw a few pics of my kids up there. Anyway, thanks for taking the time to tune in. Hope you got a lot out of it. Until next time, stay sweaty and enjoy the ride. Have a good day.